Welcome. Uh, just one announcement. We have an ad board meeting this Wednesday. So, got a thing going for us. Do we have any other announcements that I'm not aware of? Morgan's dad moved out for three years, thank God. Um, but he moved out with nothing. He needs anything, furniture, bed. He's just in a small studio, so he doesn't need much, but he would like a bed or a mattress tonight <laughs> instead of a floor. And he has nothing to sit on, so he's on the floor a lot. <laughs> um, dishes, washing pans, anything. Dishes, dishes, pots, pans, silverware, glasses. I buy of dishes if he's not picky. So, um, so if you do, just give me a call and maybe we can arrange a time. You want to stop at my house after church? Like I said, I've got a lot of things. I have to be somewhere. I have to be somewhere after church. Oh, okay. Thank you. I can bring her next Sunday. If you okay. Like. But yeah, if anyone can help out, just give me a see my daughter's graduation pictures they're on the bulletin board right up there and I think they came out really well so I had to post them. <laughs> Alright, do we have any birthdays or anniversaries this week? Alright, let's sing. shows us.
concerns today. I have a joy. Yes. My hand is healing fantastically. Good. The stitches, well, I'm assuming, I go to the, my post op appointment on Tuesday. Okay. I'm assuming that uh, the stitches are healing. And then we'll talk about this day. <laughs> <laughs> and then I truly will be handicapped. Just so you know that. Well, the right, right hand? hand? Yeah, I'm, I'm with yeah. you. My left hand is adornment and balance. That's it. <laughs> yes. Uh, our our in the long road child, David, has applied for nursing school for both KDCC and uh, KCC. So he's just waiting to get in. So let's pray that he gets in, please. Or he'll get in eventually. It's just he needs he needs the next step in his life. I just would like prayers for my mom, please. Um, she won't answer her phone. I know she's okay. I checked, I begged her. I don't know what her problem is, but she doesn't want to talk on the phone. Oh. So I'm, I'm concerned about her. They say she's eating well, but she's sleeping a lot more often. So they check on her seven <coughs> times a day. Okay. Uh, leaving her room seems to be issue for her. She's got a cat now, so she, like I said, they're checking on her often, but I don't know what her, I, I just worry about her, okay? okay? All right. Please, prayers. Yes. One of my sisters is facing second cancer surgery and of all places on her tongue. Wow. Oh, wow. Okay. So, well. She had the one she went to before affected her speech, and this will probably make it worse. But this is going to be happening uh, late next week. So. First, my sister, and then Miss Johnny. Any news on Tom and Rachel? Last I heard, he was doing well. He's going to be at home, though, for about six to eight weeks, he said. Madison that just graduated, she's traveling. It's made us very nervous, but um, they're in the hot spot. They're in Myrtle Beach. So just pray for safety. They're young kids. They don't always use their brain like they should. But just 
Neither do most adults, you know. Right. I'm just going to leave it vague, but prayers for Jack McCulley. All right, let's be in a time of prayer. <coughs> Almighty God, most high above all heaven and earth, you have set your plumb line in the midst of your people that we might know without question your righteousness. You have laid up for us hope in heaven, strengthening us with all power. Here now as we lift our voices in praise to your holy name. We have received your gracious love, but we have not shown our true thankfulness. We are called to love you with our whole heart and mind and soul and strength, yet we withhold our total commitment from your service. You have called us to love our neighbors as ourselves, but we argue about who should receive what we have to give. We leave our responsibilities to others while we claim to be too busy. But you do not discriminate in your mercy. Forgive our selfish ways. Blot out our sin and give us a new sight that we might see neighbors where now we see only strangers. In the power of your spirit, your chosen ones have gone into the world to speak your holy word. Take us from our daily tasks, equipped by the same Spirit and filled with knowledge of you, and send us out to proclaim the message of salvation and to bear fruit in every good work. It is easy for us to imagine persons found beaten by the side of the road as in need, but open our eyes that we might also be aware of those who are beaten by the less visible things which destroy life. Lead us to works of mercy for those who are hungry and weak. Visit those who are in distress from illness of the mind. Bind up the wounds of those who suffer in the body. 
bring light to, to those who live in darkness of spirit, love into wholeness those who are dying, and give joy to those who mourn. Give justice to the weak, O Lord, and uphold the needy. Answer these prayers which we offer to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Scripture reading today will conclude our series on uh, the book of James. This is James chapter 5, verses 12 through 20. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth, or with any other oath. But your yes is to be yes, and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. Is anyone among you suffering? He must pray. Is anyone cheerful? She is to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? He must summon the elders of the congregation, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up, and if he has done any sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The active prayer of a righteous pers person can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky gave rain, 
and the earth produced its fruit. My brethren, if any among you wanders from the truth, and one returns him, let him know that the one who has turned a sinner from the wandering of his way will restore his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. The word of God for the people. Please pray with me the prayer to the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful. Grant that by that same Holy Spirit, we may be truly wise and ever enjoy your consolations. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So as we come to the end of James, we have, uh, as I promised, a repeat of verse 12 because it seems so strange sitting there in the middle of these kind of exhortations or admonitions. And it's followed this time uh, by this idea of, well, first of all, the question is, is any among you suffering? And um, that word suffering is, I, I get why they, they chose that translation, because the rest of it's really long, if we did it just by the definition. Uh, but the word there is um, kakapathias. And it's a compound word. And it's, the first one is kakas, which, if you just let your imagination run for a moment, you can figure out which word it turned into in Spanish. Okay, so it is, it is an external ugh, evil, bad, okay? And then pathias, is, which is where we get pathology. So it's uh, a condition that um, in something that creates this kind of external ugh, or evil. So it's kind of hard to, um, to locate that in a single person because that word can mean a person who is both uh, suffering from somebody else doing an evil to them, or it can be somebody who has that internal drive to cause an external suffering. And the best example that I can give of this is, um, is like spousal abuse. So it's, it is, can be a reference to both the abuser and the abused. So are you abused? Is somebody doing bad things to you? Or are you the abuser? Is there something in you that leads you to want to do bad things to other people? Then, he says, pray. Now let's not just pray. The idea there is that you go away and pray. Or you stop the interaction and pray. So there is, a, even in stopping, there is an activity to withdraw. Are you abused? Get out of there. Don't let it continue to happen to you and then pray for your healing. Are you an abuser? Remove yourself so that you don't do that anymore and pray. Let, in a, in a very real way, in this situation, James is saying, 
Let your no be no. No, I will not be abused. I leave. I pray. No, I will not allow myself to abuse. I leave. I pray. Let your no be no to these evil things. In contrast, let your yes be yes. Are you cheerful? Well, don't just walk around with a smile on your face. Sing, people. This is it's kind of funny because my daughter, the actress, hates musicals. She's like, uh, nobody just burst into song in the middle of the day. And I'm like, have you seen your grandfather? Which, of course, I inherited from him. Everything somebody says, there's a song, there's a lyric that ties to it, and I'll just break into that song. That's what I do. And that's what my dad does. <laughs> Or when you're in a certain situation, what do you do? You pop on the headphones and you pick that song that matches your mood and it helps you just kind of work it out. Let your yes be yes. Don't go, oh, yeah, man, I'm happy. And sing about it. Sing praises. There's an activity in that. It's not just passively receiving or being in the cheerfulness. It is actively singing the praises because of it. And then he asks, is someone among you sick? And there's, a again, a couple of ways this can be translated. First, it can be some kind of debilitating illness, which leaves you bedridden, basically. Or... It can just mean some kind of weakness, a physical weakness or a moral weakness or whatever it might be. So are, are any of you in that situation? Well, you have something you have to do too. Summon the elders of the church. And then they have something to do. It says that they are to pray over him, but at the same time, they are to anoint that person with oil in the name of the Lord. Now here's where this is something interesting. You might not know. You have all heard of, uh, at least, you might not have heard it this way, transdermal medication. It's any kind of patch you put on your skin for pain or like the patch for nicotine is a transdermal medication. You think we invented that? You're wrong. Because the Greeks did. They would put in olive oil whatever medication was needed for the patient. And here's another little bit of trivia for you. The ancient Greeks also were working with aspirin way back then. It's called a poultice. Yeah. And, and, it was, and it was a poultice of oil and medications. And what you were supposed to do is, is basically apply that oil to the wound or to the body the medication would go into the skin or it would cleanse the wound or whatever it might be. So this anointing with oil, are you sick? You have this debilitating thing? Then have the elders come and give you your medicine as they're praying over you. In another way of that, the anointing oil was one that was put on people at their baptism so they were baptized, and then they were covered in oil, basically. It was a perfume oil. And it was, a, it was kind of a dedication to who they were. So if you are weak morally, or you feel a weakness towards some behavior or whatever, you could apply that, and it was this kind of a reminder of who you are supposed to be. And then in the midst of that, we have this phrase, the prayer offered in faith. And again, this prayer is an act of prayer. It's a praying and an applying of the oil. This prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. Either restore them to health or restore them to the community. And the Lord will raise him up or wake him up is another way to say that. And if he has done any sins, they'll be forgiven.
And then finally we have this in the last paragraph. I'm going to jump a little bit because we're going to go back. Uh, if any among you wanders from the truth. Now, this is an interesting term, right? Wander. It can mean stray or just plain, you know, any ADD person out there understands wandering really well. I mean, it's literally just like, ooh, shiny. <laughs> it was one of the hardest things for me to deal with, especially in seminary. You know how many rabbit holes I went down when I was writing papers? Holy cow. But if they wander from the truth, notice that you're not supposed to go, hey, get back over here. So not yelling at a toddler, you get over here right now, mister. Which is what my mom said to me a lot. <laughs> Don't you walk away from me. Now, if somebody wanders and somebody else goes and returns them. So if somebody wandered from the truth, you don't sit there and wait for them to come back. You don't sit there and holler for them to come back. You go to where they are. And you bring them back. Notice the activity. Even with the person who is sick, they are summoned the elders, and the elders go to them. They don't go to the elders. Someone wanders, you don't call them back to you, you go to them. This is an active thing. James is all about that. Just praying is not enough. You have to be active and prayerful. And sometimes active in your prayer or while you're praying. And then there is this phrase, if you, the one who has turned the sinner from the wandering of his way will restore his soul. Same exact word that is used for the sick person uh, when they are, uh, the prayer offered in faith will restore that person. So one is made whole, the other is brought back to community. They are restored. They are made whole again in different ways. Both of them, ironically, in ways that are associated with death. And then this phrase, they will cover, and that restoration will cover a multitude of sins. So here's a little bit of secret Jewish language James is throwing in. He talks about the prayer offered in faith that restores. The prayer offered. Okay, this is an offering. Like taking to something to the temple and offering it. And then at the bottom, the one who restores his soul from death will cover. The word cover in uh, Hebrew is kippur. Like Yom Kippur. So it will atone. And it literally means to cover. It's like to, um, or another way it's used is when they're talking about, okay, if you're out in the wilderness somewhere and you have to eat something and you kill an animal, you have to drain its blood and then you have to put sand over the blood. You have to cover the blood with the sand. And so it's a covering over so it's going to hide it. Or bury it. Bury it's a good word since we're talking about death phrases and things like that a lot. Especially in here. And so these things that we do, these actions and these prayers are in themselves kind of temp, you know, replacements almost for temple offerings. Or, or symbolically temple offerings. And they have the same effects. In fact, that word effect is the best word in this phrase that's used twice. The, the active prayer of a righteous person can accomplish much. 
That's, it's the same Greek word in that sentence used twice. Active and accomplish. Effective. And affective. So they are both an accomplishment and, and a, I've lost the word, and an influence. But notice the activity even within that language. I mean, literally, the Greek word there is energon, or energeo, which is where we get our word energy. So all of this prayer and all of this activity and the things that can accomplish are all tied together. And then smack dab in the middle of this, he has to throw this. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that, so that you may be healed. How are people supposed to know what to do for you? If they don't know what you've done. And this goes against our culture so hard. Oh, if I, and I, honestly, this is one thing that when, when Methodism started, it was simply just a group of people who got together, a maximum of 12 in any given area, and one of the things, they were, they were given several questions during it. The first one was, how is it with your soul? And the second is, where have you failed this past week? Wow. Yeah. And you had to, in that group, basically confess your sins. If we ask people to do that today... There'd be no Methodists. I think there would be a, if the list would be so long, they all get tired. <laughs> Meetings would be a lot longer, that's for sure. Yeah. But we are, we are resistant to that stuff. We're, it, it's personal. In fact, we're, we're reluctant. I mean, we'll, we'll confess it quietly to God. But that's it, maybe. Why, why is the confession out of the church? Like, well, I think in the Episcopal Church, you say confession and we sin against your God, or you mean every service. And I try to include some confessional aspect of the pastoral prayer. Uh -huh. um, I didn't know if that was a Methodist thing or just that by the book. No, uh, it's, it's, a, what a meth, it's kind of a, what a Methodist thing has become. Uh, that it's done just before communion now is basically what it is. But even then, it's, it's, it's kind of this vague general term. These, these things that we have done and things that we have failed to do or things that we have said or left unspoken. Is that, but, but there's no specific, here's what I did. But that involves trust. It does. And what does that say about us? <laughs> it's it's an it's true. I think we trust. We we trust to a certain extent, but do we trust each other enough to say, if I were to sit here and say, I'm going to sit down right now and I'm going to we're going to go around the room and you're all going to confess where you sinned this past week. Some of you up and walk out, <laughs> or at least you know mentally check out. It absolutely is. It's, one th it's, it's ironically the one thing I missed from Catholicism. To go and speak it out loud is a, is a bigger admission and in a, in a bigger sense of responsibility, really, for your action. To speak that you did this out loud is huge. 
Now, I don't miss the fact that everything seemed to be able to be covered by ten Our Fathers and ten Hail Marys. But there's still something that, that humbles you. Imagine if every Christian in the world had to stand up and confess his or her own sins before they got to the point where they could start talking about others. I bet no one would ever get to the point where they talked about others because they'd be so humbled by the fact, by the things that they themselves have done, they'll go, yeah, maybe I shouldn't say anything, and then just sit down. But because we've made it this, just, oh, it's just between me and God. Yeah, it's, this, is, this restoration here, part of the restoration is between the person and God, but the other, which is clearly a restoration to the community because you've caused harm to the community. And how can you be restored to the community if the community doesn't know what you've done? Fear enters in there. Absolutely. Because, well, let's face it. We're, there are several things about our culture. First, we don't want to appear weak. We are really high on self, um, self-support or, or what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh, come on. No, well, that too, but... Um, self-reliance. We're, we're, we're so strong on these things and we're afraid people are going to talk about it to other people that it won't be held in any kind of confidence. You don't want to be weak. That's part of it. Yeah. If I admit to something that happened it means, to me or I did something to someone, then I'm afraid I'm going to appear weak. Yep. And so we, we hold it back. It's, it's, it's counter to what our culture is, is speaking. I honestly think that, that that's kind of at the heart of the, the non-mask arguments. Because if I, if I wear a mask, some people I sure are thinking it would appear weak. But I am strong. We disguise it with what's on the right. Well, yeah, well, we disguise a lot of things with that. I can tell you for sure that math started in the Constitution. But these are, so in the in the midst of all this, James is telling us to trust one another. And that our response as those being confessed to is not judgment, but an action that helps to restore that person to wholeness. Are you, are you an abuser? Are you, do you have this morally evil pathology that leads you to try to do harm to others? Confess it so that the community can help guide you away from it. Are you sick physically or are you weak morally? Confess it. So that the community can come pray for you and with you and give you your medicine and restore you. Did you get lost somewhere along the way? Tell somebody so they can come get you and bring you back. So they can restore you. It's a, it's a team effort. It's about lifting each other up. Not figuring out where the border lines are drawn and who's in and who's out. And it requires activity on both sides. Once again, fear enters into it. Sure, absolutely. Fear is, fear is a powerful thing. Otherwise, they wouldn't use it so often. It's afraid of being judged. So here at the end, James is saying, you know, because he had that whole argument about faith without works is dead. And, and he says, or, or which one of you would see somebody who is hungry and naked and say to them, I'll pray for you, go in peace. Well, now he's saying, look, you can piece these together. It is a whole thing itself to both pray for and actively do something. That is the wholeness of the faith, to help bring people wholeness themselves. And that's why I love this last line. 
so much that the one who brings back the one who has wandered will not only restore that person, but cover a multitude of sins. It's a huge responsibility. But it's also a huge honor. Amen. Christ, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the power of God the Father, and be that balm in Gilead to restore the sick, to restore the lost, so that all might be whole one day. Amen. Amen. Amen.